How's everybody this evening? All right. The Lord gave me this message last week, and I was kind of mad because it's almost the same message Cindy preached on Sunday, but there's, it's different. But it's got some of the same scripture, but Isaiah 40 and 3, it says, and this is out of the Passion Translation. I don't know if y'all knew that Isaiah is in the Passion Translation now, but it is. I got it. Isaiah 40 and 3 out of the Passion Translation says, A thunderous voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for Yahweh's arrival. Make a highway straight through the desert for our God. A thunderous voice in the wilderness. Guess who that is? That would be him. Because Matthew 3, 1 and 2 tells us, In those days, and this is out of King James for all you King Jamers. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's all he preached. How would you like to go to church and hear the same thing every Sunday? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'd be good at that. If I could say the same things over and over, it'd be all right. But it must have been important for him to do that, right? Because the word for repent in that statement is the Greek word metanoeho, which it means to think differently. See, they had to change the way they think. Because... At the time that John the Baptist came on scene, the people people of Israel went from being Hebrews in Malachi to being Jews in Matthew. Because they weren't Jews in the Old Testament. They were Hebrews. But they just kept making law after law to try to be more righteous and be, be what... Well, their laws just basically got them twisted up, is what happened. And they thought that if they put more restrictions on the people and made more laws for them to follow, that it would be better for them. But who knows, whenever God gives you something, that's probably the best way to do it. You know, and he'd given them the laws back in the day, but they wanted to make their own ways. And they knew everything that God had done for the Hebrew people before. They knew about the parting of the Red Sea. They knew about water flowing from rocks. They knew about the plagues to get them out of Egypt. You know, they they knew all of that stuff. But who knows that the biggest hindrance to a new move of God is the old move of God. Because we expect it to be the same way every time. And God's ever-changing. God... God does what God wants to do because his ways are greater than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Who are we to tell him how to do something? You can't put him in a box because it's not going to work. But it was hard for him to change their way of thinking because I don't know if you all know anything about neural pathways, but being the scientist that I am, I googled it, and these neural pathways, I saw, I saw one study that, and I'm going to read it to you, it's short, but neural pathways, whenever you think the same thought over and over and over again, that your mind tends to go to that thought every time. So if you think, if you say, you know, I'm fat and you keep telling yourself that, then you're going to start believing it. If you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you that there's something wrong with you, you're going to start believing it, you know, because it creates, and the more you do it, the bigger that neural pathway gets. So it gets easier and easier and easier to think that way. But this, this study is called Prey Grooves in Your Brain. I thought that was pretty cool. But it says, once upon a time, scientists believed that 
that once the human brain finished developing in early adulthood, it was more or less set for life, immutable. They don't think that anymore. In fact, research indicates that frequent and repetitive thoughts actually change your brain's physiology. They etch neural pathways in your brain. In other words, the more you think a specific thought, and especially reinforce the thought by speaking or writing it, the more you groove a path in your brain, making it easier, perhaps unavoidable, to have that thought again. And that's what I was saying. Whenever, whenever it becomes easy to think that you're not worthy, you know, that God can't change me, God can't do anything for me, and you keep thinking it over and over and over again, it just makes it harder for you in the long run. But that doesn't mean you and I are stuck with the grooves our thought patterns have etched in our brains. Research also indicates that we can create new neural pathways by changing our thought patterns, a process that recommended by the great church planner, Paul, who said to be, transform, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In other words, teach your old brain new tricks. And prayer is the best way to do this. So there's, there's something called biblical meditation. You know, and that's when they're at the Wailing Wall, that's what the, the Jewish people are doing whenever they're sitting there rocking back and forth. Some people think they're trying to stay awake, but that might be what some of them are doing. But a, a lot of them are meditating on Scripture, and they just repeat the same Scripture over and over and over and over. And it, and it creates a neural pathway because whenever you hear something enough, you're going to start believing it, like I said. So if you go, if you go to a doctor... And he tells you, well, you got depression. You're like, oh, man, I got depression. And then you tell people, I got depression. Then you write it down, I got depression. Guess what? You got depression. You just accepted it, right? Well, don't do that. Because God is healing. You might have problems, and I'm not trying to diminish problems that people have you know there are things in life that get us down that are traumatic to us you know a soldier coming back from war you know PTSD is a real thing but it's fixable you know you train your brain with prayer you train your brain with scripture you train your brain to think the way God sees you instead of the way the world sees you and the way that you see yourself because I can look in the mirror and I see something different than y'all see. Because I see a hunk when I look in the mirror. I don't know what y'all see, but I really don't care what y'all see. Because I see a hunk. That's all I care about. My wife does too. So that's, that's all that matters to me. But in Isaiah 26 and 3, it says, and this is also out of the Passion Translation, Perfect, absolute peace surrounds those whose imaginations are consumed with you. They confidently trust in you. So instead of letting your mind go to that neural pathway that says, I'm fat, or I'm depressed, or why doesn't anybody like me, or why won't anybody like my Facebook page, or whatever, Set your imaginations on him. Set your mind on him who gave you that mind in the first place, but he also gave you the free will to choose what goes through your mind. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. 
Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So that's a pretty powerful statement there. Don't be pulled in different directions worrying about anything. It says it right there. Don't worry about anything. So what do we worry about? We worry about jobs. We worry about paying the bills. We worry about our children, you know, doing the right thing, growing up to be a, a good man. That's what you're going to do. Start it now. But we don't, we're not supposed to worry. And being saturated in prayer throughout each day. And that don't mean that you just sit in one place and pray. You don't have to do that. You can pray doing anything. And you don't have to pray out loud. God hears everything in your heart anyway. Because who knows that Jesus read the minds of the Pharisees and the hearts of the Pharisees. And they didn't even have to say anything. He does that to us every day. If you've got something on your heart, give it to God. Tell him every detail of your life. He already knows it anyway. Might as well confess it with your mouth. Makes it a whole lot easier. Then he don't have to pull it out of you. And he will, and he will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. Because he sent Jesus Christ to fulfill everything that we failed at. So that's a pretty good thing there to set your mind on because whenever he said it is finished, it is finished. There's How many times in Scripture does it say that we have to ask God for forgiveness in the New Testament? Zero. You don't have to ask God for forgiveness because Jesus already told him to forgive us, right? We just have to accept that forgiveness that Jesus gave us on the cross. And that's something that, that we have a hard time doing because some of y'all heard my testimony. I was a turd, straight up turd. I say was because that's the way that I thought before. But I changed the way I think. And I set my sights on something better than what I was doing at the time. So when you change your thoughts, because you have to think something before you can do something. Your body's not going to do anything that your mind doesn't tell it to do, right? So you have to have the thought to have an action. So let's do that. Let's, let's think about the good things the kingdom things that God's already got for us instead of thinking about the things that we, done, that we did even yesterday. I don't even remember what I did yesterday, honestly. These days have run together, and I still can't believe they gave me a microphone. So if I start speaking in tongues or jibbering, jabbering, forgive me. But... It also, whenever you change the way you think, it can also break iniquities off of you. Because you grow up in a family, like I grew up in a family, my dad was a womanizer. He was. He was pretty abusive to us, you know. He, he was raised that way, so he was, he raised us the way that he was raised. You know, he'd headbutt me in the face, he would backhand me, send me across the room. But that's how he was raised. And I didn't want that for my kids, so I had to change that thinking because in our family, that's just how it was. And if you accept that, and if you set those neural pathways to think that way, then it's going to be the exact same thing. But if you change the way you think from your father, your father's father, then that iniquity can be broken. But again, it takes a thought before you get an action. 
Philippians 4, 8 says, So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Because praise is the key to the throne room of God. Because you praise him, he loves it. Because you don't do anything on your own. That job you've got, give him the glory. That wife you've got, that wife I've got, I give him the glory. Because that's all him. And whenever, whenever we fix our thoughts on kingdom things, on God, on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit, then our actions will reflect that also. And people will see you, and they will know that there's something different about you. Because I've got friends that are like, who are you that I grew up with? I'm who God wants me to be because I changed the way I think. I don't think like you do anymore, dude. So, Romans 8, 6. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds life and peace. So if we think on fleshly things, that's just going to bring death. Death to the Spirit, death to the soul, death to the body. And it's like, all right, somebody gets cancer. Cancer is a terrible, terrible thing. They go to the doctor and the doctor tells them they got six months to live. If they accept that fact, they're probably going to die in six months or, or sooner. My mom, she got cancer. They gave her a year, two months, she was gone because she accepted the fact that she had cancer. And whenever, you know, whenever two agree on earth touching one thing, you're going to get it. And if two people agree on the wrong thing, they're going to get that too. And it's a terrible thing. But you get what you ask for. It's like the, you know, Cindy's been teaching on the children of Israel and how you could take the Israeli out of Egypt, but you couldn't take the Egypt out of the Israeli, right? Because they were, the, all they knew was slavery. They knew the bondage. We know bondage today. We've got addictions, you know. We, we have to have a cigarette. We have to drink coffee. We have to, to do these things. That's bondage. Anytime the creation takes control of your life before the creator, then that's bondage, people. But if you can set your mind to change your actions, you can fix it. And that's what John the Baptist was telling the people. John the Baptist... He was telling them, change the way you think because God's about to show up in a way that you had never seen before. And he did. And it made some people mad because hey, how many people know that the truth is painful sometimes? That's why my life, wife don't like me sometimes because she asked me if those pants make her booty look big. Lord, help me. No, I would never say that to her. If she don't ask me, I don't have to lie about it. <laughs> Romans 12, 2, we all know this verse. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. So, you got friends. 
your friends like to do dumb stuff. You go with your friends, you're probably going to do dumb stuff, right? Because that's thinking as the world sees it. That's, you know, that's, that's imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you because they're like, oh, you got to do this or, you know, you're a, a sissy. I'll just be a sissy. I don't care. I don't care what people think about me. But there are some people that they have to have that confirmation from other people. There's some people that they just desire it. And I was kind of upset because nobody said anything about me preaching in shorts tonight. Because that was part of what I was doing. I don't care what people think of me. Because it's not about the clothes I have on my body. It's about the spirit within my body. So, but I love y'all for that because y'all don't care. But it made me kind of sad that nobody said anything. Not even my flip-flops. Earl's not here, though. Earl would have said something. Because Earl sees, he's got that culture mindset. He thinks you got to wear boots and raise cattle. I don't know what he's thinking. That's a lot of work, isn't it, David? But it, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. So that tells me that, all right, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to be with you, and he will help you change the way you think. Because I couldn't change the way I think by myself. Trust me, I cussed. Every other word out of my mouth was a bad, bad word. And just one day, I, it just didn't happen anymore. And I was thankful for that. Sometimes I still want to. But, and it's funny because I've got a boss that he cusses like a sailor. Anybody in the Navy in here? Well, you know those sailors, they cuss pretty bad, don't they, Garnet? But anyway, he cusses bad, but every time we're talking on the phone, he, he tries not to. And it's pretty amusing, because I laugh. Because he'll be going along, and he'll get half the word out, and then he'll change the word. But that is changing neural pathways. That is changing the way he thinks. And just talking to me on the phone, knowing that I don't cuss, I don't care if people cuss because it's, it doesn't defile me. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything with my salvation. You know, what goes into the body doesn't defile them. It's what comes out that does. So it doesn't affect me if I hear a bad word. If I see something that somebody else does, I mean, that, that doesn't affect me. I might say something to them, tell them, hey, that's wrong, but... As far as a bad word, you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But just knowing that, that I live for the Lord changes the way he acts, right? Just like John the Baptist changed people back then because he told his people, y'all need to follow that guy because that guy is the one that's that's come to change everything. But it was so hard for the, for the Jewish people because they were in bondage at the time by the Romans, right? And they had this perfect picture of how the Messiah was going to come. He was going to come on a white horse with an army and take back Israel from the Roman people. That's, what, that's just how they saw it. Then he came in on a donkey without a sword, with peace. So it was kind of hard for them to see that he was the Messiah. But John the Baptist told them, it's coming. You better get your mind right because it's going to be something different. And we choose our thoughts. I know a lot of times... We think before we speak. That's not possible. 
trust me, I get in trouble for it all the time. But I know that I had to have a thought before I had a word. I had to have a thought before I had an action. So sometimes I just have to keep my mouth shut for about 10 seconds and figure out something better to say than what I really want to say. And I know a lot of people like that. Eldon would get beat if he said some of the things that he wanted to say. He, Nancy, he didn't tell me none of it, though. But you got to change your thoughts before you change your words, before you change your actions. But the church today needs to do the same thing. I'm not saying this church today. I'm just saying the church body as a whole. The body of Christ as a whole has to change the way they think because like the Assemblies of God, they look at, you know, Brownsville and how God did it back then and, and all this. And they won't even receive Bethel. Bethel, I think, is a new move of God. They do things different. But where's the script that, that God's got to follow? I've never seen one. You know, and I heard something today that it was pretty powerful because it says all of the Bible is in God, but all of God is not in the Bible. And what that tells me is God's bigger than anything that he's ever done before, bigger than anything that we've ever seen, bigger than any, anything that we could even wrap our heads around because if we could think it, if we could wrap our heads around it, he wouldn't be God. Because my wife knows what I'm going to say. I'm not God. I don't know what God's going to do. But that's what makes it that's what makes it awesome because we don't know what he's going to do. All we have to do is be the fertile soil for the seed that's being planted and have our minds set on him. Because if our minds are set on him and our thoughts are set on him, then you can't go wrong. But how do we be that crazy dude in the wilderness? Do you have friends or family that, that don't know the Lord? Do you have, uh, you know, friends that have been hurt by the church before that, you know, they believe, but they don't go to church? You might ask them, you know, just wh why don't you believe? Why don't you go to church? Why don't you do these things? Because John the Baptist was bold. He was nutty. He ate locusts. He ate honey. But he was bold because he was stepping out there saying things and baptizing. And the religious leaders were just looking at him, wearing camel hair, a dirty animal. Looked at him like he was an idiot is what they did. But he was bold because he had a purpose. Isaiah saw it. Malachi saw it. Because in Malachi, it says that Elijah was going to come before the Messiah. And John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, just like Isaiah had said, to, well, how does it say it? Make a highway straight through the desert for our God. And I think that highway is a neural pathway because he wanted to make that highway so wide that every time, every time anybody thought about the kingdom of heaven being at hand, they had an open mind because they didn't know what was coming. Because that could be 
That could be anything. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where's it at? You can't see it, but it's there. It's always here. But you have a task. We all have a task. Witness. Witness to people because the body of Christ, it's, it's ever-changing. It moves. It's, a, it's growing. But for it to grow, each and every one of us needs to be bold enough to ask someone. Do you know the Lord? And I invite anyone that doesn't know the Lord tonight to come forward and let us pray with you and let us introduce you because it's awesome. It is amazing what the Lord can do for you because he's done it for me and he's no respecter of persons. He'll do it for each and every person here. All you have to do is ask him. Ask him into your life. It don't take anything special you don't need me. You don't need Cindy. I did it in Mexico, for those that don't know. I did it in Mexico. But be careful how you word your words, how you pray. Because I told him, I said, you get me out of this, this lifestyle, and I'll follow you. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Well, about a month later, I got laid off. He got me out of it. But... He restored everything back because that's the kind of God he is.